So uh, welcome to everyone, uh, new and regulars to our Conway Hall and Quarantine Talks. This shed in Lewisham is currently uh, part of Conway Hall. Uh, the other part is in Jeff's flat, who's doing the technical stuff. Um, we hope we're all, you're all well and uh, keeping well at present. Um, so uh, the purpose for this talk, uh, well, for all our talks, is to ask questions about how we can make the world a better place. And um, obviously COVID-19, the lockdown and, and uh, the um, what's happening with that have been on our minds. And now we're asking what sort of changes for the better we can make happen due to COVID-19 and the lockdown and universal income has been one of them. Uh, so before I introduce uh, Dr. Guy Standing, I just want to say that, so Guy's going to speak for about 45 minutes. I'm going to scrabble around in the background just to make sure I can get my laptop working for the question and answers, which will come straight after Guy's talk. And uh, then when we time for questions, please put questions into the question box in Zoom. And uh, also please, um, if you wish us to open your microphone so you can ask a question directly, let us know. And if you'd rather we, you wouldn't, you don't open your microphone, let us know that too. So um, with all of that, uh, I'm gonna try and get my hand off the screen. Um, do, you do you please welcome uh, Dr. Guy Fernanding. Uh, um, he's the author of numerous books, including uh, Basic in Income and How We Make It Happen and uh, The Plunder of the Commons. Uh, he is the co-founder of the, you're gonna have to help me out guys, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly- Yeah, bien, bien. It's called Basic Income Earth Network. That's it. National NGO. So, basic income. So do please uh, welcome, speak on the ethical arguments for basic income in the pandemic. Do please uh, welcome Guy Standing. Thank you, Guy. Well, thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. It's obviously a strange phenomenon giving a, a talk when I can't see people who are listening or falling asleep. But I, I hope to present the thesis in enough detail for you to be able to follow it. Let me first of all define what we mean by basic income. I don't use the term universal because you're going to have some restrictions or otherwise everybody would flow into the country to take the basic income. I use the term just basic income. And what it means is that every individual in the country who's a legal resident would receive a modest, regular monthly payment uh, without conditions, without means tests, and regardless of age, gender, marital status, household status, or labor status. And uh, if you wanted, you could claw it back from the wealthy by marginally increasing tax rates. Um, and very importantly, anybody who has extra costs of living would have supplements. So people with disabilities would have an extra amount to enable them to have the same equal basic income uh, security. Now, it's been controversial for a very long time. I've worked on this for over 30 years and we've had many conferences and for a long time, it was a marginal issue. It's obviously become very uh, interesting and topical during the pandemic, and I'll come back to the reasons for that. But I think that the objections are the standard objections that have come up to every progressive social policy in history. And Albert Hirschman wrote a wonderful book in which he documented how the standard objections came up each time. And then once the policy was introduced, those objections all sort of faded away. And I believe that's the case uh, with, with basic income. Now, I, I'm going to argue this afternoon that the fundamental rationale for a basic income is ethical or moral. And I believe that the ethical rationale has now been aided by it becoming an economic imperative. And I'll come back to that. Now, I don't have time, I will not have time in this talk to, to go through the objections, the standard objections that have been made. I deal with those at length in the books if people are interested in that, but I want to con concentrate on the ethical rationale. And um, in that context, I first of all want to paint very, very briefly the economic background. The economic background is that our economy 
in the last 30 to 40 years has gradually evolved into rentier capitalism. What that means is that more and more of the income and wealth has been flowing to those who own property, financial property, physical property, and intellectual property. And it can be illustrated by the incredible statistic that today financial assets are worth over 1,000%, 10 times national income. It's that degree of, of inflated uh, part of the economy. And what rentier capitalism has done is generate what I've called in a new book, Battling Eight Giants, I've called them eight giants. And it takes that, the notion of giants from something that William Beveridge said in his famous 1942 report, which set the standards for the post-war welfare state. The eight modern giants that I've discussed that have been growing in strength and threat are inequality, insecurity, debt, stress, precarity, losing rights, automation, the robots, the threat of extinction, the ecological crisis, and finally, the growth of populism that we're seeing in the United States and we're seeing in Britain and seeing elsewhere. And those eight giants, in fact, were threatening our economy and society before the pandemic hit. And the book that came out in March, coincidentally, and was written last year, was basically saying that with those eight giants, you only need a trigger to have a phenomenal crash. And of course, the trigger has been coronavirus, COVID-19, which has been the equivalent of the trigger of, against the Archduke in August 1914. It wasn't the cause of the war, but it was the immediate trigger. And that is the background context in which we have to consider the appeal or otherwise uh, of a basic income. Now, in that context, I want to say that the ethical justification has three strands. The first strand is one of common justice. And it goes back to the Charter of the Forest, which was sealed in Westminster Cathedral on the 6th of November, 1217. 1217. And it basically said that every Englishman has the right to subsistence in the commons. Everybody has a right to subsistence. And you can trace that through the struggles throughout our history. And a way of interpreting that is to say that the wealth and income of every single one of us, you and me included, is far, far more to do with the efforts and achievements of the many, many generations before us than anything we do ourselves. And in that respect, if we allow for private inheritance of private wealth, then we should have a sense of social inheritance of social wealth in the form of social dividends or a basic income. For me, that is a foundational principle of justice. And it goes further in the sense that if you look through our history, systematically, as every school child learns, we've seen the ordinary commoners losing the commons through enclosure, through privatization, through, through theft through many ways. And in a sense, a basic income would be a compensation for the loss of the commons. And that doesn't include just land or water. It also includes our social amenities that have been stripped, particularly during the austerity era. And you can extend that to the idea of ideas. Thomas Jefferson famously said that ideas in nature cannot be made the subject of property. 
If he were alive today, he would be in a constant rage because systematically, particularly since 1994, there's been a strategy of privatizing and commodifying intellectual property rights. Today, there are more than 14 million patents in operation, each of those patents guaranteeing a monopoly profit for the person or the corporation that has filed those patents. As it happens, most patents are the result of publicly funded research. That means you and me have been paying for the costs and the risks, but we don't get any of the profit. The profit goes exclusively to very, very plutocratic individuals or more likely corporations who are hoovering up patents and are translating that into billions of pounds, euros, dollars, and so on. It's been shown that the patents do not increase innovations. More often than not, they prevent innovations and hold back technological pro progress. So there is not an economic justification, but morally it is repugnant that the ideas that have been built up through generations of people thinking, tinkering, etc., are leading to a vast flow going to a minority. And there's a wonderful example. In 1955, Jonas Salk, who had just invented the vaccine for polio, and he was interviewed on, TED, on TV by the iconic Ed Morrow, very famous for exposing McCarthy. And Morrow asked him, who has the patent for this vaccine? And Falk looked at him and said, well, the people, I suppose. Uh, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? Now, I feel today that when they get that vaccine for coronavirus, some corporation is going to be making millions and billions. And just like many, many other innovations, they're going to be put outside the scope of millions of people. Now, there's an effort to try and prevent that, but the very fact that you have to make such an effort is revealing of the fact that we have a systematic abuse of taking rent income. And a basic income would help in recycling the income of monopoly profits. And again, we have the system of subsidies in Britain. I did a calculation for a book where I found that there are 1,156 forms of tax relief in Britain. And according to the Treasury's own data, that means that we lose, as the public, over 430 billion pounds a year in non-collected revenue. That is money going to a few. It's going to a rich few. Many of them are morally objectionable, including agricultural subsidies to the benefit of Ian Duncan Smith, for example, who gets 150,000 pounds a year in subsidy, just for having a lot of land. And we need to say, well, instead of all that subsidy going to the few, how can you give that ethical justification? You can't. It should be put into a pot and helped to give people basic income security. Then there's the argument about intergenerational social justice. I was invited to the town of Middlesbrough to present one of my books. And I went there and I was shown around the town, the countryside around it. And it revealed to me a simple truth. In 1820, Middlesbrough was a hamlet, nondescript little place. And then they discovered iron ore. And in the 1830s, 1840s and so on, it became the hub 
of the Industrial Revolution and the hub of our national wealth. But if you go there today, it's a place of poverty, it's a place of the precariat, bricked up windows, tiny handkerchief gardens, poverty everywhere. I looked up the statistics, it's one of the highest areas for coronavirus deaths and morbidity. Meanwhile, down in the south of England, the descendants of the mine owners are lavishing in the wealth, sending their children to the fanciest schools, enabling them to have a great life, great opportunities. And that's fundamentally unfair. A basic income, in a sense, paid to everybody would be a compensation, an intergenerational justice point of view. You then have to think that with rentier capitalism, we have a scandalous situation that in the last 30 years, the worth of, value, uh, the worth of wealth, private wealth, has gone from 300% of national income to 700% of national income. And wealth inequality is much greater than income inequality in Britain. And if wealth inequality is growing, if wealth relative to income is growing, then total inequality obviously is growing. It is an unsustainable trend because it's generating many other phenomena. But we need to rectify it as a matter of priority. And we can only do that if we introduce a mechanism like a basic income, which would transmit a sense of redistribution, recycling of some of the both. That is the economic side of justice. There is also a question of religious justice. I was delighted a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, where it was, when Pope Francis came out in favor of a basic income. Never done that before. And he made the comment, whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. I agree with that sentiment, but I think a better argument from the religious side is the argument that God has given us unequal talents. And in a sense, a basic income would be a compensation for those who have been less blessed with talent and those who have talents to make a lot of money and make a lot of profit. To me, that is a compelling argument, whether you're religious or not, I think it's important. And it goes with the sentiment, which I've seen in all religions, that a good person gives generously, and he gives or she gives unconditionally. I think that is a good moral principle. Now, in that connection, one should think about compassion. One of the worrying trends in our society over the last 30 years is the growth of the charity state. More and more people are being told, give charity. And more and more we see huge numbers of our fellow citizens dependent on food banks, soup kitchens, shelters, handouts, depending on us giving. And we are giving out of pity. And as David Hume taught us, pity is akin to contempt. It's not respect. We need to put the charity state back in the margins where it should be. Having a basic income as part of a core new income distribution system will help do precisely that. 
There is also a question of tax justice. At the moment, if you are in the precariat and you are dependent on universal credit or the legacy benefits as they're called, going from those benefits into a low wage job means in effect you will pay a marginal tax rate of 80% or more. That's the Department of Work and Pensions own calculation incidentally, not mine. I think it's probably more. What that means is that they will only get an extra 20%. That's a big disincentive to taking low wage jobs. Meanwhile, the higher income earners are only paying roughly half of that, 40% or something a little over, if they really pay their taxes. This is fundamentally unjust to be taxing the poorer people at a higher rate than the richer people. Similarly, one should expect that Wealth should be taxed at the same rate, at least, as income. But it's not. We don't have taxes on wealth. And it is inherited. Over 60% of wealth is inherited wealth, so you can't claim it's the result of income, earned income. It isn't. It's the result of inheritance. And we should be having a tax system which at least taxes all sources of income at roughly the same level, and earned income, if possible, less than unearned income. This system is the reverse. That is unjust. And then we come to what I call work injustice. Work is treated ridiculously in our statistics, in our rhetoric, by our commentators, by our politicians. Anything that is done unpaid is not called work. So if you hire me to look after your child, national income goes up, jobs go up, and I start getting entitled to some benefit if necessary. If I instead look after my elderly mother and frail people in my neighborhood, National income, as measured, goes down. Work goes down. Jobs go down. And benefit entitlement goes down. This is ridiculous. Totally absurd. And it is sexist. Because most of this unpaid work is done by women. It's ridiculous. Now, not only do our measured income statistics not take account of this, but the ONS itself, the government's own statistical office did an estimate and they worked it out that unpaid care work, this is before the pandemic, is worth 1.24 trillion pounds, more than all manufacturing jobs, all non-financial jobs. And yet it is treated as non-work. Now, in a sense, a basic income would be a compensatory mechanism which would reward people doing unpaid care and other unpaid work and give us incentive for us to do more of it. That I think is a matter of justice. For me, in the end, I go back to Thomas Paine. He said, quite rightly, that it's not charity, but a right, not bounty, but justice that I am pleading for. Now the second ethical rationale for a basic income is that it would enhance freedom. And in that respect, it would enhance three types of freedom. The first freedom is the one that the political right usually talks about and that Milton Friedman recognized which is that everybody must have the right to choose, the right to decide. And as Friedman himself in his later years, and that's why he joined Bien, incidentally, in his, in his 80s, um, almost had a guilt, I felt, that means that people have to have enough security in which to be able to make choices. If you're chronically poor and insecure, you can't make good choices. You can't be free. 
So that sort of freedom is important. And it's a very important also to think of what I call the paternalism test principle. It's unjust to impose controls on some groups that are not imposed on the most free groups in our society. But our modern policymakers do the opposite. They impose controls on the low income people who are needing benefits. They say you will only get it if you do this, 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 and this, and you don't do this, 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 and this, and our bureaucrats are going to decide. And no due process, no judge or anything like that, we will decide. That is a huge deduction of freedom for the very people who need it most. And it goes with the rights not charity principle of freedom, which is that a social policy is just only if it advances the freedom of the recipient rather than the, the discretionary power of the provider. We see abuse of that principle every single day. Now I think the second form of freedom is equally important and everybody who regards themselves as a liberal should re respect liberal freedom. Liberal freedom is the freedom to be moral. The freedom to be making moral decisions and actions. And you can only be moral if you can make those decisions without being told what to do and what not to do. You can't be moral if you're a slave. You can't be moral if you're so poor and insecure that you, you have no options. That's very important. The third form of freedom is what I call Republican freedom. This also is extremely important and it goes back to Aristotle. Republican freedom is the freedom of non-domination and potential domination. A woman is not free if she can only do things with permission from her husband or her father. You can't be free. Even if they're the most benevolent, nice people, and they will usually say yes, or almost invariably say yes. That's not the point. Republican freedom means freedom from potential domination. And that is why when we've done pilots with basic income, I've been rather impressed by the fact that in a few cases, women leave abusive relationships because they have their financial tickets, their own freedom. No, they won't say yes, they say no. That's real freedom. Now the third ethical rationale for basic income is that it would give basic security or would enhance basic security. Basic security, not total security, but basic to be enough, is a human need and it is a public good. It's a superior public good because my having it doesn't deprive you of it. In fact, if we all have basic security, it enhances the value of that basic security for everybody. You don't have that in rentier capitalism. You don't have that in a society of chronic insecurity and chronic inequalities, where people are staggering from debt to debt to debt, and where they don't have resilience. The key word is resilience. If you don't have basic security, you're living a norm of constant stress. And the psychologists have taught us that stress induces what are now being called preconditions. They induce morbidity, hypertension, cardiac problems, blood pressure, suicidal tendencies. The limit, as they've been documenting, deaths of despair. And insecurity has a huge social cost. 
But it's not just the insecurity that was dealt with in the post-war era through contingency benefits. It's an insecurity that is linked with a very modern form of uncertainty. We live in an era where millions of people feel their life is one of uncertainty. What that means is unknown unknowns for which you cannot have a social insurance or a proper insurance. You feel that you're going to be hit by a shock at any moment. And you feel, and it's true in many cases, that it will be harder to cope with the shock and harder to recover from the shock. And this goes with what the psychologists have taught us about a shrinking of the mental bandwidth. They have good terms, these psychologists. Well, what it means is that it actually reduces a person's IQ. If you are chronically insecure for any length of time, your mental capacities depreciate. And therefore, it is immoral, amoral, to expect rational, responsible behavior from people whose mental IQ has been diminished by their material circumstances. Now, a basic income is not a panacea. It's not going to be curing all forms of insecurity. Of course not. But it is a weapon to give basic security. And it will also help in dealing with what I've called in my book, The Precariat, the precariatized mind. The feeling of unbounded rationality, a feeling that you don't know what's the best use of your time. And therefore you make mistakes and you're worried. And because you're worried, you make more mistakes. In a sense, a basic income can give us a better sense of control of our time. And that is something a good society should value very, very highly. For me, basic security is just as important as the freedom arguments and the common justice arguments. They make a trilogy. Now, the last part of my talk, very, very, very briefly, because I'm running out of time, is compare the ethical arguments that I've been trying to make with the ethics of the existing measures being taken by the government. I find it extraordinary that the degree of criticism of what they're doing has been remarkably mute. What they've done, first of all, is they've been spending huge amounts of money, and that amount of money should be judged by the opportunity cost. In other words, what it could have been doing had it not been doing what they're spending it on. And the first thing is that the job retention scheme, it, it, it defies my economics. I have a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge, so I should be a reasonable economist, right? I cannot understand the economics of the job retention scheme. Because what it does is it gives much, much more income to high-income earners than it does to low-income earners. It's regressive. But it gives £2,000 to a, a month to a salaried worker who can work at home. Uh, it gives him on condition that he or she does no work. Now, the logic of that escapes me. It's the first time in history that governments have paid people on condition that they don't work well. I don't understand the logic of it. Other countries haven't done that. But it rewards people who are higher income earners. And I predict that when the analysis of the scheme is done, after we've got out of this situation, it will be shown to have had at least 40% dead weight. What that means is, that most of the jobs may have continued to exist regardless of the scheme. And that many people who are taking the money will be continuing to work or being paid later or other various things. 
I'm prepared to take a bet of 10 pounds, anyone, that when they look at the analysis in a couple of years' time, dead weight will be enormous. But the irony is that while they're giving 2,000 to a wealthy income owner, they're only giving 400 pounds to somebody in the precariat. If they lose 20% of their income, their debts become unserviceable, and they're more and more likely to be in the food kitchens, food uh, banks, and homeless, being put up in a shelter. Because that amount for the person who's earning a little is a huge amount. So it's fundamentally unfair. It's even more unfair for those on universal credit who get an extra 20 pounds a week. Now, meanwhile, just been looking at the figures, the Bank of England has been giving dirt cheap loans to major corporations. And the biggest recipient with over a billion pounds is the German chemicals giant, BASF, B-A-S-F. BASFA is the biggest chemicals company in the world, and it's not a made British taxpayer or anything like that. In fact, only 0.007 of 1% of its workforce work in Britain. So why are we giving a billion pounds to a major corporation who could easily have paid for its own loan needs, its projected revenue this year is 115 billion euro. It's just come out. It's ridiculous that many other of the biggest corporations are receiving government largesse and help when they could have easily got the money if they needed extra liquidity from the financial markets. So we have a situation where a lot of money is being spent that you can't justify on ethical or moral grounds. You may say that pragmatically we had to do something, but you didn't have to do this. My hope, and I hope it's not too late, is that as it evolves, the government will have the wisdom to shift from those subsidies, which are contributing to the depth of our economic slump, without a doubt. Shift from that to say, let us be on the road to give a basic income. Let us be on the road away from conditionality, means testing, subsidizing the wealthy and not everybody else. Let us think about a more convivial way forward out of this situation so that everybody can benefit. To me, that is an ethical argument. It's an argument that all of us should be able to understand. When it comes to this, do we want everybody to have basic security and freedom that we all wish we had? Access to do justice, access to a more abrasive society in which we can genuinely say, yes, we're all in it together. Because at the moment, that's not the case. At the moment, we have the potential to move to a basic income. And I'm delighted that the latest opinion polls in Europe have shown that 71% on average of people are now in favor. If you'd said that to me 10 years ago, I'd have said, I'm dreaming. But I believe it's up to us. I believe it's now up to us to give the politicians who have spaghetti backbones a little more courage. I cannot tell you how many politicians of different parties have told me in private at various places, various times, that they favor basic income, but they don't know how to come out in favor. Now's the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Um, technical problems now resolved. That was brilliant. We do have a number of people with their hands up, um, which I will go through and let us know if you would like your um, if you'd like your microphone opened or not. Um, 
we've got a number of questions. We've got about 20 minutes or so. Do please, do please be brief when asking your question. Uh, no micro let lectures ended with do you agree, please? Um, so I'm going to start from the top and open the microphone for Conway, first of all. Conway, I don't know if you're any re re relation to Conway Hall, but hello, your microphone is open now. Okay. We're going to move down to uh, Gilles Morin. Your mic is now open. Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, who's that? Uh, Gilles. Gilles. Yeah, we right. can hear you. Okay. Um, a very interesting lecture. I, I have a, um, a question about the two experiments on uh, basic income that I know of. The one was in Namibia and another one in Quebec, in Dauphin. Both experiments were successful and both experiments were abandoned in spite of being successful which left the uh, beneficiaries of this experiment out in the cold. So if we were to start again, how can we make sure that we go the whole way and uh, don't let people down? Shall I answer the question? Yeah, yes, please. Okay. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. Uh, as it happened, you're looking at somebody who has a strange habit of doing pilots of basic income. I've been involved in pilots in four, four continents. And I, I helped design and implement the Namibia uh, pilot. And we said at the beginning, because we only had the funds for that, that it would be all finished in two years. And it started when we said it would start and it ended when we said it would end. So it wasn't abandoned in any, in any sense. It was, it was a deliberate, specific pilot. You have to have a test, you have to have a duration, etc. And I was in the area at the end of the pilot talking to people who'd been recipients. And they were all very fortunate in they knew their basic income had helped improve their life. Nutrition had improved, health improved, uh, farming methods had improved, the crime had gone down, and the status of women had improved, right? And I, I was convinced by the end of that that a short-term pilot is much better than no pilot at all. You actually do have changes that take place. When India, where we did much bigger pilots, where we provided over 6,000 people with basic income and had a control groups of another 6,000 that didn't have, and we looked at what happened over, over two years, we did what we called a legacy survey, which was after it had ended. And we did one three years after it ended, as well as one year. And there were many things that they had broken through as a result of the basic income that didn't go back. There wasn't recidivism. And the biggest thing was the breaking of bonded labor, debt bondage, and women's status. The certain things that when they happen, they don't revert. There are other things that do go back, uh, that, that, do, that, that don't last. But I have very, very little doubt. We asked the questions. We asked people, are you pleased that the pilot had taken place? And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, they said, yeah. And overwhelmingly, those people in those villages have continued to support it and lobby it and speak up for it. Now, the Dofa experience is slightly different in Manitoba, not only was a new government elected, which immediately killed it, but the data were lost. All the data were lost uh, that were evaluating what was happening. And then they were found years later in a whole lot of boxes, all the data. And very dedicated people have been doing uh, analysis of those data. 
And what it showed, the biggest thing for me, and I've summarized this in, in one of my books, Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen, is that it resulted in an 8% decline in the use and need of public healthcare facilities because people had better health, and particularly better mental health. To me, that is a, a finding that we see in different types of pilots in different countries, even though many of the pilots, as I've explained elsewhere, are not really ideal pilots of a basic income, but they're somewhat of a basic income. And in every single case, the reduction of stress and the improvement of mental health and mental balance has been an outcome. And I think that's impressive. Okay, thank you, Guy. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Jen S for the next question. So, Jen, I'm going to open your microphone up. Talk. Hello. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah, so I believe the Labour Party su supported the furlough scheme. Um, so where are the voices in Parliament supporting UBI? And I'm thinking of, like, in the US, you had that um, presidential candidate that did a lot to raise the profile yeah, Andrew, yeah, of UBI. Yeah. So who, yeah. do you, are, who, who are those advocates within Parliament? Well, you're touching on a sore, a sore nerve, if you like. Uh, last year, John McDonnell asked me to prepare a report on piloting basic income if Labour uh, were elected. And we had a plan and it was a report was issued in public. I had the public support, Ed Miliband and, and John and uh, all the Labour leadership. And many of them have said to me in private, as I was referring to my speech, uh, how they support basic income. And yet now they seem to have decided collectively as a leadership under Keir Starmer that they're going to give uh, quiet support to what the government is doing. I, I personally am in a sort of state of shock and disappointment that they're doing that. I that's justifiable, it's not courageous, and it's not consistent with what they, what many of those people had said to me before. So I, I'm very disappointed. I'm still delighted that some of them have made sure that they are speaking up. And I'm, I know several of uh, MPs are listening to this, this talk and have been very courageous politically in maintaining their support. And don't forget there was a letter in Parliament, signed by 170 MPs and members of the House of Lords in favour of a basic income, and uh, friends of mine were, were involved in that, I, I think it's up to us to say, no, 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 you can't, you can't duck it. You can't duck it. What they're saying is that this is not the time to make critical remarks about what is being done, but they are beginning to do that anyhow. I don't think that's justifiable. I think that the, the wage subsidy scheme is re ridiculously regressive, as I've just explained, and I've written several articles going into the details of how regressive it is. But, but I am disappointed. But what is interesting is the Greens are 100% in favour, the Lib Dems are going to have a new leader that supports the, the Scottish National Party, Plaid Cymru. So many are coming out. And I just hope that Labour will have the courage and integrity to do the same. We can't go backwards. Jonathan Reynolds, who's a friend, I think, who is now the, the shadow secretary for Department of Work and Pensions, he told me last year, he went on talking, went on tours, talking tours with me, advocating basic income. He's now gone silent on it. I would like to know the reason. As you can tell, I'm choosing my words as carefully as I can, but uh, it, it's a good question. Thank you, Guy. The next question comes from Faith. Uh, Faith, just unmuted your mic. Hello. Okay. 
while uh, while Faith comes, I'm going to try uh, Graham Taylor. See if you're are you available to ask a question, Graham? Yes, can you hear me? You can. No, I can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, I, we'll I have Faith to... next. So, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, cheers. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Scott. Sorry about that. So if you were talk, you were Karen talking, Scott. Yeah, do please, Graham. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. Um, I loved your talk, Guy. It was very um, uh, 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 all about the economic um, problems we have in this country at present. But my question goes back to what you said at the beginning of your speech and, um, and uh, a histrionic back into the 80s. Uh, do you think the facts right years threatened to stop the free NHS system in this country that William Beveridge, which had one of his evils, placed together in society for the sick? And do you think her poll tax regime started off the poverty trail for inequalities in this country? I'm not sure, Graham, if I, if I follow your, your, your question, but um, what I am convinced about is that many of these problems uh, stem from the economic strategy pursued in, by Thatcher in the 1980s. I think rentier capitalism stems from that financialization and the fact that they're sucking out more and more of the income, leaving the precariat with fluctuating, stagnant, declining incomes. Something that I didn't emphasize in my talk, which is that in Britain, more than elsewhere, but similarly to elsewhere, that the share of national income going to those people who do labor, who work, is going down and down and down. It's a secular trend and the scrambling of the that sh declining share with the precariat getting stagnant and falling incomes is increasing the, the insecurity uh, that i that i'm talking about making the necessity of a basic income and it was a tragedy that new labor went to means testing and behavior testing that must come with means testing and then you get ian duncan smith in introducing universal credit which is the most horrible social policy in my lifetime, I think is, is, is a, a path that was inevitable. And I, I happen to have written articles in the 1980s predicting the path because it seems so obvious. And, and, and I get no pleasure from saying, I told you so, because we don't need that and we can see where it's going and we're going to get more social violence down the road. We're going to get more social illness, more preconditions for another pandemic slump. And as long as large groups of people are left insecure without basic income, the probability of a second round, a third round of deaths, excess deaths is very high. And unless we realize that and put that point into practice, I'm sorry, but we don't have a very exciting short-term future at the moment. Thank you, Guy. I think Faith has got the next question. Are you there, Faith? Hello, Faith. Okay, no problem. Let's go to uh, John. You've got a hand up. Can you hear us, John? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can indeed. Okay. Um... I was interested, first of all, I found your talk quite moving. Um, I'd like to learn more about the, you know, the details and so on. Um, but um, I'm intrigued by your point about the narrowing of mental bandwidth and that comes with, I suppose, basic material insecurity. Um, but I wonder, you know, with freedom comes inherently a certain degree of uncertainty. I think that would seem to be kind of part and parcel of freedom, existentially speaking. So I wonder if you have something in mind of like an optimal um, point of tolerable uncertainty or insecurity. I'm, I'm not sure how. Yeah, I just suppose I have my general question is the relationship between insecurity, uncertain, uncertainty, and, and freedom itself and the capacity to make choices among various options and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. That, that's why I use the, the term basic security, not total security. I think that, you know, again, Aristotle said the, the insecure man is free. And there's a certain degree of truth. We, we don't want total security. It leads to carelessness. It leads to 
lack of responsibility, etc. We need basic security in order to function. We, know, we need to be able to say, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to be able to afford my food and my rent or whatever. And I'm going to be able next week and next month and next year to have enough on which to, to build a life. And then we can accept insecurity in going for better than that. I mean, you are talking about a modest basic income. And I deliberately don't give a, a figure because it's a matter of moving down a road. I give me a drink or two and I might give you a figure, but the essence of it is to be moving in the direction of giving people equal basic security. The rich people have oodles of security. That's why we talk about idle rich sometimes, irresponsible rich. I mean, Boris Johnson and his pals in the Bullington Club acted incredibly irresponsibly because they had total security. Their dads and mums could pay for the restaurants they were smashing up. What, what we want is not total security, like the Toffs have, but the ordinary person needs to have that basic security in which they can function. And where the psychologists have shown is that if you're constantly insecure and you literally don't know where, how to feed your child, how to look after your elderly mother and blah, 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 you, you, you lose that mental bandwidth. And I think that makes sense. And what I really found fascinating in the, all the public, as I mentioned earlier, was this feeling that if you have basic security, you become more tolerant of others. You become more altruistic. And you become a better citizen. And I think that is the ordinary human condition. You don't design policy for the exception. You design policy for the human normal. And we all need basic security. And that, I think, is the fundamental argument. And I can't think of any other social policy that does that as well or to any extent as, as well in universal terms as basic income. It's not a panacea. Other things are needed. So we know that. We know that. Thank you, Guy. Um, I'm going to open the microphone of uh, Jan, Eric. For They've got their hand up. So uh, are you there, Jan? Right, can you hear me now? We can hear you yeah. now. Yeah, that's uh, every conversation starts these days with can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to ask you, fantastic, fantastic talk, thank you. Uh, I saw, you know, they did a trial of basic income in Finland. And when I saw the reporting on it, some of the reporting at least that I read, reported it as a failure. Because if I remember right, they said that it didn't really increase people working more. So economically, it was judged a failure. Now, as, an, as a, an afterthought, they sort of put, well, it did increase people's well-being. But actually, politically these days, someone's well-being against economic, you know, people don't, don't really seem to see that as a worth investing in. But so anyway, it, it got reported as a failure, saying, well, look, we tried this, but it didn't increase people, you know, working more. And that was the point of it. And so basic income doesn't work. Uh, so I'd really like to know your view on that. And, and just to say one thing, you're talking about justice, I mean, I, if I understand this rightly, rentier capitalism as it is now is basically slavery, where the mass of the people do the work and they're working for almost nothing. And basically all the work they do, all the benefit, that just goes to a couple of people. I mean, so that, that to me, I'm, I mean, you sort of alluded to it, but to me, that's the major basic injustice that we're slaves. You know, most of the people are slaves. So um, I don't know if you agree with that. But anyway, those are the two things. As, as regards to the last points, I'm, I might use more judicious uh, language uh, because it, what is unjust about it is that more and more the income is going in unearned ways. <clears throat> so I leave it at that. Now, you, my, you may have noticed, or if you've been near me, my blood pressure went up when you mentioned the Finland case. I, I happen to have been consulted at the beginning of that pilot by the Prime Minister's office in Helsinki and I strongly advise that uh, 
they do it as a community uh, experiment. In other words, give everybody in a community the basic income and then see what would happen. But they decided, uh, the Minister of Finance, who was a member of the right-wing party, insisted that it only went to 2,000 unemployed. So immediately it ceased to be a proper basic income experiment. They were randomly chosen all over the country. Now, uh, then after it was scheduled to last from January 2017 to December 2018, right? That was the plan. That was the budget. And uh, after about a year and a half, uh, the BBC and The Guardian reported that it had been a failure and abandoned. And I was phoned up and asked to be interviewed. I said, what? Never, what's, what's going on? So I immediately contacted Keller, the National Insurance Office, and the people running the project. And they said, no, guy, it's not been abandoned. It's not a failure. What are we talking about? I said, thank you. Fine. Okay. The project went and ended exactly on the day it was scheduled at the outset to end. And I despise journalists who, because they have something wanting it to fail, invent a story. It went to the end. And as it happens, the analysis has only just been revealed. I've got a copy in Finnish and in English three weeks ago. All right. And it wasn't a failure in the sense that they could latch on to, because what it, ha what it did, it showed that by not having any conditions, they got that basic income without being told they have to look for work, do this, that, and the other as before, made no difference. So that telling people to do this and that is not necessary. People still continue to look for work. Some got work, some didn't get work. But very interestingly, and not reported in the British media, is that actually a lot of those people started crafts work and secondary work doing small-scale activities without being in formal jobs. That is good. It also showed, as you just said, perfectly correctly, that it then showed less stress, more better health, better happiness. People started doing retraining, learning other things. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? If that's a failure, I'm a duck. I don't quack very well. So for me, it's, it's the distortions that anger me. But it wasn't a real basic income. I'm glad that it's being treated. And now we have Spain that's, being, uh, that's introducing a scheme. And I've been involved in the Spanish debate about it because it's not a basic income either. But it's a step in the direction. So one shouldn't be too churlish about it. Sorry if I sound a little angry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how, how, how are you doing, Guy? Uh, we've got a lot of questions like, here. I, uh, I would like to answer one unasked question, because somebody, okay. somebody has said, pity you haven't discussed the objections. And I, I, didn't mm, I saw that in the chat. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I didn't do that deliberately, because I didn't want to use up the time that I had. As you saw, I nearly ran out of time anyhow. I wanted to make the ethical case because I've talked many, many times, written a lot on the objections. But I want to deal with just very briefly one standard objection that Ian Duncan Smith is using in the Commons to corral Tory MPs to be against a basic income now. He's going around saying that if we had a basic income, people would stop working. And we can't have a disincentive to work, is his argument. What I find repugnant about that is this is the man who designed universal credit. And each year he receives, without doing anything for it, £150,000 in subsidies simply because he inherited through his wife 1,500 acres of prime land. So if you have prime land, the more land you have, the bigger the subsidy you get from the government. It's unearned, but I noticed that he doesn't stop work. Some of us might think it would be a jolly good idea if he did stop work, but I noticed that he doesn't. So why is it 
that if he gets £150,000, he doesn't stop well. Why should he presume that somebody getting £100 or £200 a, a, a week would stop work? The better argument is that, in fact, it's his existing system which discourages people from taking low-wage jobs because of the poverty trap that I mentioned in my talk. And every single pilot that I have been involved in and I have read about and talked about and every experiment has shown that a basic income does not reduce work. In most cases, it increases work. Certainly in our pilots, it resulted in people doing more work, having more energy, more initiative, taking more risks. It's a, it's a middle class prejudice to say that if people had basic security, they would stop work. They want to improve their lives. They want to improve the lives of their children, their communities. We all do. It's the normal human condition. And I think that is a nasty class-based argument that should be laughed at. It really should be laughed at. But that's one of the standard objections. Okay. Um... We've got we've got more questions that we can answer, everyone. Guy, could you answer another couple? Or sure, that's that's up to you. Brilliant. Uh, we don't want to keep you here all afternoon, so we're going to do three more. Um, I think, and um, take it from there. Uh, Faith couldn't get her microphone working, so her question was, "What would be the likely cost of brace basic income in the UK compared to current benefit costs?" Well, there are different ways of answering that. Certainly, relative to what they're spending this year, much, much less. I mean, it would be, if they're talking about between 200 billion, 300 billion that they're spending extra uh, in response to the pandemic, that would have easily paid for a good basic income for everybody in the country for this year. What I've argued is that it's important to gradually phase in basic income at a decent level by building what I call the Commons Capital Fund along the basis of the Norwegian uh, Pension Fund or the Alaska Permanent Fund, which take the proceeds of carbon tax, of uh, various other taxes, and build them up. One of the arguments that is absolutely fundamental is that a basic income can rectify or slow down the threat of extinction, the biggest giant that we face. And the ecological justice can be acquired by having carbon taxes. Carbon taxes go give us income to go into a commons fund that, as it were built up, could recycle from the dividends from that fund through investments in ecological sustainable industries and be able to build up a higher and higher amount being paid out. I've explained the, how it would be done reversing these 430 billion uh, subsidies, a pound of subsidies, by putting funds into a capital fund, build it up, and as it builds up, paying out a higher and higher base income. To me, it's, that's a route, that's a, a route. Some of my friends uh, who support basic income <clears throat> have another route. I think that's a political decision. But I really feel that it must be an ethically driven Route. In other words, be justifiable on the principles I've discussed this afternoon. And building up a commons fund, uh, as I've explained in my book, Plunder of the Commons, it is a viable, ethical, and ecologically important way of combating the threat of extinction and giving us a better society. Thank you. Um, I think, the thanks. Thank you, Guy. Um, next question goes to David Richardson. Uh, David, I think your uh, microphone's unmuted. Thank you, yes. Uh, well, actually, just follow, following on from that, I mean, I, I think that's, that's the way we want to get to in the long run, but given that politics these days seems to be single liners, and uh, I mean, when the Greens put forward uh, basic income a couple of years ago, um, they, they were slated because of the cost of it. I mean, is it not best to start with something more modest, recognising that um, uh, current, uh, uh, all the allowances that people get are not very far off um, 
a, an amount that that equivalent to to what a single person gets on say universal credit and try and roll that across as a, as just a total re, um, redesign of the tax system and simplification of the tax system and then work from there to put in more 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 resources from common fund and so on um is that not the more realistic sort of political route in, to get where we might want to get in five or ten years time. Yeah, I, I know where you're coming from. Or I think I know where you're coming from. And I, I have sympathy with the, what you just said. I, in, in my book, Battling Eight Giants, which is based on my, the report I did for John McDonald, I basically lay out five ways of moving forward. And I'm proposing pilots of all five methods in different parts of the country. And one of the things that we, we found <coughs> last year is that a number of places in Britain would like to do a pilot. I think actually at this juncture, that we would make most progress if we could just get the politicians to allow pilots in certain places to see how it could be implemented, what it could replace, how it could move away from all those sanctions and punishments and lack of due process that's involved with universal credit, which is an evil scheme. I'm sorry, it's evil. It's not legal. It, it abuses the basic principles of Magna Carta. It's shocking. And move away from that and have in certain areas a pilot. Now, I've been having the privilege of working with the groups in Scotland who been planning and were given money by Nicola Sturgeon to prepare a plan for how it could be piloted in four areas. And the report has just come out. The people of Sheffield are wanting to do a pilot in Sheffield. Last year, and I had the privilege of speaking to the council, Liverpool City Council voted overwhelmingly that they wanted to be the site of a basic income pilot. And there are various other parts of Britain that have expressed interest. It's a cross-party thing. It should be. And it's something that should be welcomed whether you're a, in the member of the Conservative Party, or the Labour Party, the Greens or whatever. We see it in different ways. We see it. I'm a green left, if you like, but we see it in different ways. But it is something that could improve the human condition and our society. And doing pilots would allow the politicians to feel that they, they're doing something, but they're not doing something that's irreparable, you know, which I believe that once it's done in one part of the country, everywhere will want it. And then the politicians will have to take notice. Okay, thank you, Guy. Um, just trying to unmute one other person, but um, let's go back to hands up uh, for our final question. So let's hope it's a good one. Hang on. Um, sorry, I was like, so Conway, are you available? It'd be great if uh, you were. Otherwise, we shall try Anya. Are you free to answer a question? Hi, I wanted to ask a question about charitable giving. You talked about it in terms of pity. How would you see charitable giving changing under a basic income? I like that question. I, I mean, I like most of us. We, we give to charity, we support and admire those people who are involved in charities, uh, often in very difficult circumstances and every day be feeling bad. So we admire those people. What I believe is what David Hume said, that the charity is about pity. We pity the people we help. And pity is akin to contempt. We don't respect those people. However much we, we, we pretend, however much we feel and salve our conscience and so on, we don't feel like them. We try to empathize, we try to show compassion, but I don't like the idea of society relying on charities. It shouldn't. It's undignifying both to the givers and the takers. Particularly if you are a recipient and you have to say, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, please. I, you're a supplicant. And that's what being in the precariat feels like. I cannot tell you how many people write to me 
having read my book on the precariat, saying that is how I feel every day. And for me, that is not a good society. You should not have millions of people feeling like supplicants, relying on favors, discretionary judgments, hoping that I haven't offended, uh, that I, please, I'm, I'm, you know, I, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That's not a good society. And, and it stinks, in my view. But I'm not in any way critical of people who are involved in charities. I just think they should be put back into dealing with, with the, the margins, not dealing with the mainstream, which is where they're being pushed at the moment. It's ridiculous. And I'm sure that many people in, in charities feel roughly like that. I hope they do. And I think so, because I'm often in contact with them. And I, I admire people who are doing it. I certainly admire them. But I don't think we should have a society that relies on them. It makes sense. Ethically. And with that great word, I think we should close it there. Um, I know there are lots more questions and no doubt some furious debates some of you would like to have on this subject, going by the chat and the Q&A, but um, I think our time is done here for, the, for this afternoon. Uh, Guy, thank you very much. It was a fascinating and inspiring talk and uh, apologies for our previous uh, technical issues to you and our audience. No um, well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. I, I appreciate that. We appreciate um, this afternoon. This... <laughs> okay, cheers. Thank you, thank you, Guy. Uh, we Thanks do. For everybody. We do have another talk book for two weeks' time. It's not gone on, on details yet. It is. Uh, we're now running a talk we previously booked called we'll "Display It Like You Stole It: Museums and Ethics" uh, with Alice Proctor. That's a way of looking at museums, questioning their their um, their role in fortifying imperial myths and also uh, their um, quite colonial acquisition policies. So keep an eye on the uh, Conway Hall website and newsletters for that. Um, thank you again. Uh, just to remind, I didn't remind everyone earlier because I was struggling with my phone. Uh, Conway Hall is a charity. Our charitable purpose is to bring talks like this to people to encourage thought. Um, if you haven't donated to us for, to attend this talk, please do. And do please sign up for future talks by the Conway Hall. Thanks again for everyone to everyone. Thank you to Jeff for your support. Thank you to Guy for um, giving that brilliant talk. And uh, can I say thank you very much. Have a good rest of day. If there is sunshine where you are, do please go and enjoy it. And uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you.